even though it's so horrible what's happening with the regime, that it's created the perfect pressure cooker for people to realize just how wrong the regime is, just how wrong Islam is, and they're looking for truth. Could Iran finally be on the verge of a leadership change? Hi, and welcome to Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg, a podcast of the Joshua Fund, a ministry dedicated to blessing Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus. I'm Carl Muller, Executive Director of the Joshua Fund, and Joel, joining me from Jerusalem, Iran has been in the news lately with these large-scale protests. For listeners who haven't been following the news, what's going on? Well, it's a real tragedy that's unfolding in Iran, Carl. And uh, I, so there's a couple of factors going on. What Basically what's happening is um, you have several pieces. Number one, you've got the supreme leader of Iran, the Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. He's old, he's infirm, he's becoming increasingly ill. Uh, he recently had surgery. Uh, the New York Times reported that uh, he was on his deathbed. Um, our news agencies, all Israel news, all Arab news, uh, are, are aren't able to confirm that he's that 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 it's that bad. But look, at some point, Hamanai is not going to be in this world anymore. Um, now, uh, and the question is, who will come after him? Now, at the same time, there's the president of Iran. His name is Ibrahim Raisi. Now, Ibrahim Raisi is on the U.S economic sanctions list. Why? Because, well, for numerous reasons, one of which is because he oversaw the execution of upwards of 30,000 Iranians in 1988, slaughtered them without trials, without uh, just cause. And it, uh, even an Iranian top leader at the time called it one of the great, one of the greatest crimes ha ever committed in the history of Iran. Mm. But Ibrahim Raisi also is in, as, as president of the country now and previously as the head of the, the justice ministry, the head of the judicial system, he's responsible for executing hundreds and hundreds of children mm. and of torturing uh, Iranian uh, prisoners, political prisoners, religious prisoners and others. He's, he's, he's a horrible person. And plus, he and the uh, supreme leader are lying to the world about, you know, they're saying that their, their nuclear program isn't a problem when mm. we keep finding evidence of them cheating. But on top of it, they keep cracking down on the freedom of Iranians just to just to assemble or to speak uh, in protest against the government, which which is bringing so much economic uh, pain and suffering um, on the people. And and now the religious police have been accelerating their beatings of women who are not wearing their hijabs correctly. The hijab is the wow. Islamic covering over your head and and usually your whole body, but uh, particularly your head covering, the scarf, is in, in Iran, it, you can't see any of the woman's hair and it has to be just so. Well, it's one thing to say this is the way it has to be. It's another thing to have religious police on the street beating mm. women for not doing it correctly. Mm. Um, and hmm. recently there was a there was a case uh, that has become a huge flashpoint. There was a young woman named Masa Amini, young woman in her in her 20s. She wasn't wearing her hijab correctly, according to the religious police. They beat her. They arrested her. They threw her into prison and they tortured her and beat her so badly that she died. Well, the news of her death at the hands of this wicked regime has reverberated throughout the country and, and brought people out on the streets. And some women are burning their scarves in public. Others are throwing them off and saying, I will not succumb to this. But, but they are being beaten and they are being killed. And, hmm. and it's, it, it's, it's a snowballing effect, um, but it's really showing just how wicked the Supreme Leader and the Iranian president really are. These are, these are sick evil men and mm. and the and the nation knows it mm. and they are rebelling they're revolting against the leadership um but the and and they're and and the leadership is showing why there's why they have the, the lost the the, the the support of the people 
um, by beating and murdering people. So it, wow. it's a, it, we need to be praying for the people of Iran right now. And yeah. we need to pray I'm, for a leadership change. Well, I mean, I think this is this is what's so fascinating about this subject. You know, most Americans will will think of Iran if they think of Iran at all. Um, from images from the uh, U.S. embassy takeover and right. uh, the hostages that were being held and the the thousands and thousands marching in the streets sh- shouting death to America, but uh, but really that leadership that's currently in place came out of that. But but you say they've lost the population. How how is that so? What why is Iran's culture different from what their leaders are trying to promote? Yeah, so. In the 1970s, uh, Iran was ruled by someone uh, called Reza Pahlavi, and his title was that he was the Shah of Iran. That's the the Persian word for like king or the pharaoh, or the, the, it's their version mm-hmm. of, of, of the of the supreme leader, uh, the Shah, the Shah mm-hmm. of Iran. Now, the Shah of Iran was an American ally. He was a, an ally of Israel. Uh, interesting. We we bought most of our oil in the 1950s, 60s, 70s from Iran here in Israel. Interesting. But uh, Mm -hmm. the Shah was also corrupt and horrible with human rights abuses. And he had his own uh, secret police called the Savak. And and, and people were were angry and they were, and there was a real momentum building. And there was a, there was an exile. uh, There was someone who had been a cleric who'd been sent into exile, first to Iraq, later to Paris, who was having his people smuggle cassette tapes of his sermons back into Iran, saying, Iran's Shah is evil, he's corrupt, he's pro-America, he's a, he's a Zionist, and he needs to be removed, and we need to get back to pure Islam. Hmm. And this leader was called um, Rahola Khomeini, hmm. the Ayatollah Khomeini. Now, in 1979... Uh, in February uh, or in January, the, the Shah realized he could read this, the, the writing on the wall to cite a Bible passage about, uh, you know, from the book Persia. of Daniel about <laughs> a leader being in trouble. And the Shah fled with his family. He also had cancer. He needed cancer treatment. So he fled with his family and, and a lot of money that he just took. And on February 1st, 1979, the Ayatollah Khomeini landed in Paris from, I'm sorry, from Paris to Tehran. He landed in Tehran wow. and millions of Iranians lined the streets between the airport and, and the capital. And they said, the Holy One has come. The Holy One has come. They, they, some believe that he was the Messiah or the 12th Imam. The point mm-hmm. is that everybody in Iran was excited that the Shah was gone and Khomeini was, was leading an Islamic revolution. They further love that the, these Iranian uh, radical students took over the U.S. embassy on November 4th, 1979, and for 444 days held Americans hostage and brought down the Carter administration and humiliated the United States. But as Khomeini and his crew cast an iron grip over the people, they began to impose a level of, of um, what they would say Sharia law, but a very brutal um, version of Islam. Some might mm-hmm. say it's the right version of that. That's what Islam is. Others would say, no, no, no. It, but what? It, let's not get into that point right now. The point is the very Iranian people who thought that Khomeini was bringing liberation from oppression – now, increasingly, as years went by, felt more and more oppressed. And as you got into the 90s, uh, it was 1989 that Khomeini died. And who took over? Well, one of his disciples, Ali Hamanai. And Hamanai is the supreme leader today. Mm. He is the Ayatollah today. And he's been there since 1989. And he is even worse than Khomeini. Wow. And he's brought mm. suffering on the nation. Uh, he's so determined to buy, to use all their money to buy weapons, to buy, to build a nuclear weapons industry, and 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 resisting the the international sanctions. But people are are poor, and they're suffering, and there's there's hopelessness, and so this is building and building. And every now and then, 
people decide, I don't care if they kill me. I'm going on the streets and I'm going to protest because we have to bring this government down. But then the government comes out and beats mm. people and kills people and tortures people and, and arrests people. And then it quiets down for a while. Yeah. But there is a seething, a seething um, unrest going on that is similar to the Arab Spring yeah. that we saw bring down the governments of Egypt and and Yemen and Libya and other countries and then and Tunisia and tried to bring down the government in Syria, but the, the Syrian leadership under Bashar al-Assad just started killing people, <laughs> and they're still killing people today. So yeah. the Iran Iran has followed the Syrian path, I guess that you could say. My we're mm-hmm. not giving up. We're going to just kill people and arrest we're people until they stop. Mm-hmm. But this is creating more and more tension and. Uh, mm. it, very painful. The interesting thing is the Bible speaks to the future of Iran and Bible prophecy tells us yeah. that judgment is coming to the leaders of Iran. Yeah. Well, we're going to, we're going to get to that in just a second before in a little bit, we have to take a break, but I wanted you to just also maybe share a little bit of, again, you know, this difference between these corrupt uh, leaders that have, that have uh, uh, taken the country in a direction that is way beyond where the, the the general populace is. I know a lot of us in America have have friends or maybe even relatives who uh, from a, an Iranian or Persian background uh, have have come to the US and we've gotten to know them and they are they're bright, they're articulate, they're they're cultured, they're they're hospitable, one of the most hospitable cultures in the world. And yet, you know, the, the, the common misperception about Americans is that all Iranians are these angry, bitter people like their leadership seems to be. And I, I just want you to comment a little bit about on, on yeah. these these protests as as sort of a reflection of that that great fracture, that great tectonic fracture between these two things. Yeah. Well I think that most of the Iranian people supported the radical Islamist revolution, the Islamic revolution in nineteen seventy nine. I don't think there's any question about that. But they 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 were in for rude awakening. The the very people that, and system and and theology that the Iranian people thought was going to liberate them has in fact mm. enslaved them even worse true. than the Shah. Mm. And that has been a, a, a terrible tragedy. Um, and so what's happened is the more brutal that the Iranian regime has become, the mm. more resistant and rebellious the, the, the Persian people have become. Millions of Iranians have now decided they are done with Islam. If the Ayatollah Khomeini, the Khamenei, the supreme leader, if that's real Islam, they're like, I don't want it. Now, they may go wear the hijab or go to the mosque with, in order to keep a public image so they don't get beaten or arrested or tortured or killed. But inside their homes, inside their families, inside their hearts, they're done with Islam. That is opening a door for the gospel. What's also interesting is because, you know, actually satellite television is illegal in Iran. That's why everyone has a satellite dish. Exactly. It's part of this rebellious nature. Like you can't tell me everybody has bought, I mean, most people have bought a satellite dish and what are they watching? They're watching American television. They're watching mm-hmm. American news. They're watching the BBC, British news. They're, they're watching gospel satellite television. Um, and they're looking for news that they can trust. They're looking for uh, spiritual wisdom and guidance and hope. Yeah. It, because they feel like everything they've been brought up to believe, they now believe is wrong. Now, I'm not saying yeah. every Iranian thinks this. There are many who support the regime, but fewer and fewer. And in fact, many be, uh, actually love the United States and love Israel. Why? Because the Iranian regime keeps saying that Israel is the little Satan and the United States is the great Satan. And so people think, yeah. well, if you in the regime think that Israel and the United States are bad, and we know that you're evil, then the United States <laughs> and Israel must be good. Yeah. And so it's really quite, it's really quite fascinating. And I will say, to, to wrap that part up, one of my friends who I call the Billy Graham of Iran, right, the, the, the an Iranian who was on the streets of Tehran in 1979, shouting death to Israel, death to America, he became a follower of Jesus, and he now runs the foremost gospel preaching satellite television network in the world, beaming the gospel over the heads of the clerics and the Ayatollahs and everybody yeah. and the government into Iran. And he believes that even though it's so horrible what's happening with the regime, that it's created the perfect 
pressure cooker for people mm-hmm. to realize just how wrong the regime is, just how wrong Islam is, and they're looking for truth. They're looking yeah. for hope. And they're many, not all, most are, are turning to atheism, but many are turning to faith in Jesus Christ by the several million, we believe. Um, and so that's amazing, but it tells you this incredible ferment. It, it's, it's, um, I'm not sure we can think of, I can think of almost any other country, maybe China would be one where now we've got, we went from almost no Christians when the communist revolution took over and Mao took over. Now we have upwards of a hundred million or more born again followers of Jesus in a country that's where it's illegal and dangerous to be a follower of Jesus. But the communist system has created almost the perfect pressure cooker for people to realize that's sick. What's Mm -hmm. happening in Beijing, that's wrong. And Mm -hmm. they've been looking and they've been searching and God has been meeting them. Well, I know that you wrote a book on this at one point uh, as well called Inside the Revolution, about the three revolutions in Iran's history, that way, uh, modern modern history. And we can talk about it in a second. And we also want to come back and really talk about um, what the Bible says about Iran and the hope that we have looking forward. But we'll come back in a second. Our verse of the day today is found in Jeremiah chapter 49, verses 38 and 39. Then I will set my throne in the Elam and destroy out of it king and princes, declares the Lord. But it will come about in the last days that I will restore the fortunes of Elam, declares the Lord. And our prayer requests today are these. Pray for the people in Iran. Pray that Christians and underground pastors will be strengthened and strong in their witness and pray for the family of the victims of the current political crackdown. And finally, pray that God's peace will reign in Iran and throughout the epicenter. Hey, Joel, we're back, and I am excited to uh, really bring about you know our focus from the horrors of the current regime to what the Bible says about Iran and the promises of hope in the future for this country. And for the people there. We, we've already alluded to it a couple of times, but what, what does the Bible say about the future of Iran? Yeah, well, there are, you know, the Iran is actually mentioned quite a bit in the Bible. Um, and of course, there were moments, there were seasons of tremendous uh, oppression and evil uh, from re- various regimes inside Persia. That's the ancient name for the country we now know as Iran. Um, but there, uh, and, and one of those famous stories is in the book of Esther, right, where Haman, uh, who is essentially the prime minister or the president of Iran, number two under the the, the king, uh, uh, Artaxerxes, and Haman was so evil and he wanted not only to kill one Jew that had offended him, but he wanted to kill every Jew in the empire. And at the time, the Persian Empire stretched, according to the Bible, from India in the east to Ethiopia in the in the west. That's amazing, that scope. And the Jews were were enslaved uh, in Persia at that time, and that and they were and and this leader Haman wanted to commit a genocide and literally annihilate. That's the word that's used: annihilate all the Jewish people. So that was wicked. But then we also have the story of Cyrus, who the Bible prophesied specifically by name. There's going to be a leader that rises in Persia. His name is going to be Cyrus, and then he's going to come and liberate the Jewish people and send them back to the land of Israel and help rebuild the temple. And that's exactly what happened. So there have been times um, in the past uh, of great evil and great good in Persia. And there are several Bible prophecies about the future of of Iran, one of which is, of course, Ezekiel 38 and 39. We've talked about that in the past, but just to say Mm -hmm. Russia and Iran are going to form an alliance together and then with a group of other countries to attack Israel in the last days. Okay. And, and as we've discussed in previous podcasts, God's going to supernaturally rescue the nation of Israel right at the last moment when it seems all hope is lost and rain fire and other judgments down on the enemies of Israel, including Iran. Hmm. So that's one set of prophecies that we know to be true. It has not happened yet, but, um, but it's coming. 
and it, and the Bible says specifically it will happen in the last days. But hmm. there's another prophecy that gets less attention. Um, not that Ezekiel 38 and 39 gets much attention, though this year with Putin sort of looking at like, wow, maybe he's Gog. You know, we don't know, but he certainly seems Gog-esque. Uh, but but there's another prophecy, Jeremiah 49, and it's it's really fascinating. Uh, Jer- it starts in verse in Jeremiah 49, starting in verse 34 to the end of the chapter, which is verse 39. Mm-hmm. Now, you just referenced two of those verses. That, that's the hope at the end. But the first yeah. part comes the horror. And um, the, the thing to understand, again, some of the, sometimes the Bible uses ancient names uh, to describe nations. And we have to do a little bit of historical detective work to understand what nation – is God speaking of? And what we hear sure. have here is a prophecy against Elam, E-L-A-M, Elam. Now, when you do that historical detective work, you find out that the nation, uh, the ancient name Elam was the nation we today call Iran, okay, mm. or also has been known as Persia. And what's interesting is that in the book of Jeremiah, it says the, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, the prophet, the prophet concerning Elam. And thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, God says, I am going to break the bow of Elam, Hmm. break the military power of Iran, the finest of their might. I'm going to break them, God says. God says, I will bring upon Elam or Iran the four winds from the four ends of heaven, and I will scatter them, the people of Iran, uh, to these winds. All over the world, the, the Iranian people will not only be judged, but they'll be scattered and there'll be no nation, the Bible says, to which the outcasts of Iran or Elam will not go. So I will shatter Elam, again, shatter Iran before their enemies and before those who seek their lives. And I will bring calamity upon them, even in my fierce anger, declares the Lord. And I will send out the sword after them until I have consumed them. Hmm. That's bad, right? So what the Bible is saying is there is a this nation of Iran, as you go deeper into the last days, it's going to be so wicked at the top mm-hmm. that God is going to bring judgment. And he, why does he tell us this in prophecy? So that we have hope that, that evil, wicked men will not prosper forever. They, 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 they will be there for a time. They will do their worst, but God will then rescue the nation. So now, then first we see judgment. And then, then the verses that you just read, verse 38, then after the judgment, God says, I will set my throne in Elam or hmm. Iran. I will set my throne in Iran and destroy out of it king and prince. Again, the, the, the judgment's focused on the leadership, probably the military also, based on the breaking of the bow and the finest of their might. So the military, the whole intelligence and security structure, but starting with the king. That is the supreme leader and the president and everyone down the system. He will, God says, I will destroy them, declares the Lord. Then, but verse 39, but, and this is one of the blessed buts of the scripture, but it will come about in the last days, God says, that I will restore the, the fortunes of Iran, mm. declares the Lord. So you have two things here. I mean, we don't have the time to go literally, you know, verse by verse, but you have the judgment of a wicked leadership. Okay. It's going to be devastating. God says he has fierce anger. Mm. And then you have hope. You have horror and you have hope. You have the restoration of the nation of Iran. And God says, I'm going to set my throne there. Now you're like, whoa, whoa, time out. I am um, Lord. I thought you were setting your throne up here in Jerusalem. Like, Jerusalem. isn't this your chosen city? <laughs> and of course, he is going to do that. So you're like, well, isn't that a contradiction? It's not. What this means is after God brings judgment on the leadership of Iran and liberates the nation of Iran and then restores the people, like, like I think this is going to be an acceleration of the spiritual awakening, hmm. the great awakening that's already happening in Iran where millions hmm. of people have left Islam. They've come to faith in Jesus. But it's going to get, there's going to be more, okay? Yeah. And God says, I'm going to set my throne there. What does that mean? My interpretation, but more importantly, the Iranian pastors and ministry leaders, including the Billy Graham of Iran or Mo Shariat, their view, and I 100% agree with them, 
means God, Jesus Christ is going to set up his spiritual, uh, the center, the epicenter of his spiritual uh, kingdom for a, a period before, before he sets up his literal physical kingdom on earth in Jerusalem. He's mm. going to, He's going to turn Iran into the missionary sending country wow. that's going to reach the world for Jesus. Wow. Now, that's amazing because it tells us there's a moment of hope coming yeah. in the last days. And we're in the last days. So when we see this wickedness get worse and worse and worse and people suffering and Iran trying to get the bomb and sure. threatening to wipe America off the map and Israel off the map and just killing their own people you realize that is not happening in a vacuum. God is watching and God mm. promises to bring judgment, but also hope and a spiritual awakening. And I'll tell you, Carl, you know, Iranians who've come to faith in Jesus. Uh, when they, when a Shia Muslim has come to faith in Jesus and is filled mm. with the Holy Spirit, that passion to export the Islamic yeah. revolution around the world turns into a passion for the great commission. Amen. preaching and teaching the gospel. And Iranians are fearless. They're fearless for an, a false religion today yeah, and a, and a wicked regime today, but they're going to be fearless for the gospel just the way the apostle Paul went from a religious terrorist as a Jew to the greatest apostle um, in the history of the, uh, of the early church. So Amen. that's what's coming. It's pretty exciting. Amen. Very exciting. Great hope. I mean, you know, <clears throat> I was I was checking the internet out for the recent passing of Queen Elizabeth II, and and maybe you came across this story that uh, this book on Nostradamus is apparently flying off the shelves because uh, apparently one translator's of no Nostradamus is very cryptic um, uh, poetry and and such uh, indicated that Queen Elizabeth would die in. Uh, the twenty twenty second year of the of this century, and um, and that she, she would be replaced by one who is not loved much, <laughs> which to many people here sounds like a, a just a precise fulfillment of scripture, uh, of uh, of the prophecy of Nostradamus, not scripture. Sorry, but you know when you look at scripture and you look at the way God has so uniquely and intricately um, developed. The, the prophecies around Israel we've talked about, but Iran as well, uh, it is remarkable that the Bible isn't flying off shelves as much as, <laughs> as, as others, because we see the setup for this, this uh, Jeremiah prophecy going so much according to the script that the Bible has already given us. Um, these evil leaders are, are producing a stench in God's nostrils, and God is not to be ignored. Uh, his... his uh, his plan will be fulfilled. So uh, I think that's that's incredibly encouraging, isn't it, Joel? It is. And, I, you know, look, I, there have been many throughout the ages in other religions and certainly Nostradamus who have tried to <laughs> you know, throw their uh, their uh, their darts at the board and hit a bullseye. And uh, usually what it is, is people are looking at these things later and going, well, I think that kind of maybe that fits this. And, you know, they're just, it's not, it's, it, this is not stuff you can, you can base your life on. Um, but I will say that the Bible talks about that there will be false prophets who are able to give you advanced knowledge of the future. Sure. And um, that is a, that's a, that's a, a topic we should discuss in the future. What is false prophecy and why sure. are some false prophets able to actually give you um, like the fortune tellers, you know, who can, yeah. who, you know, people who, you say, okay, well, mostly it's goofy. Yeah, it is. Um, but sometimes they're right. And you think, well, how could they be right if they're wrong? Like if they're yeah. if if they're not doing it from God's power or knowledge, then why does God let them be right about certain things? And and the reason is, um, we'll look at it more later, but 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 it's important to know because God is testing us, he says. Mm. Uh, we see this in in um in Deuteronomy chapter 13. Uh, in fact, let me just read it because it's it, it, it's important to to draw the distinction between real prophecy mm -hmm. and and false, false prophecy. prophecy. And when people like Nostradamus or others are perceived as getting something right, or maybe they actually get something right. Now, you could say, well, even a uh, a stopped clock uh, is right <laughs> twice a day, right? So, okay, yeah. so it's possible. But listen to this. This is interesting. Deuteronomy thirteen: If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or wonder and the sign or the wonder comes true concerning which he spoke saying let us go after other gods whom you've not known 
known, and let's serve them. God says, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to find mm. out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. So there, hmm. it's important to know that with, whether it's Nostradamus or others in other religions or, or whatever, fortune tellers or whatever, uh, psychics, evil can give you an advanced knowledge of some things. Hmm. But it's a test. It's a test to think, oh, maybe I should follow that guy. Maybe I should go pay him. Maybe I should pay her. Maybe I should drift, get away from the Bible and the one true God and go follow other things. Because, you know, he did tell me the future. No, that is dangerous. Yeah. It can happen, but it's dangerous. And um, and it's all false prophecy. So yeah. the, what's interesting is we're watching Iran just become more and more wicked at the leadership level. And, and there's the people of Iran are suffering. And just as mm. the prophecy is about Israel becoming a nation, a sovereign independent state and Jews returning to the land after centuries of exile, 19 centuries of exile, just as that has come true. And it's such a great testimony uh, and evidence that there is a God and the Bible is his true word. And the things that he said in this word in the Bible will come true and they are coming true. By the same token, these prophecies about the judgment that's coming to Iran are also true. And it's important exactly. to, that we know them first, just to have hope that this wickedness will not last forever. But also we need to communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ to a nation like Iran. Why? Because judgment is coming. Ezekiel 38, 39, Jeremiah 49, and people are going to die and some will go to hell in that judgment. And we want them to repent ahead of time. We want them to come to faith in the one true God mm. and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to know the word. And so that's why these things are so important. Amen. So our, our hope for Iran truly is found in the pages of Scripture. It's found in the, in the, in the promises of God and, the, and, and for his fulfillment of what his intent is for that country. And it's not, uh, it's not to be missed that God loves the Iranian people. I mean, I think I think right. the idea that God cares enough to to restore their fortunes, to bring them back into a place. And I love your picture of of uh, perhaps Tehran being the the missionary capital of the world uh, in some future picture of how God yeah. would restore these fortunes is is beautiful. Um, what 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 ways can we be praying right now for Iran, the people? And even for the leaders, I, I'm always reminded, and I've told you this before, of the, the organization I, I, I formerly was with, Open Doors, and Brother Andrew, who pointedly asked me during the uh, early part of the, the, the war against terror, have you prayed for bin Laden? And, you know, that first piercing moment of, wow, I, I haven't prayed for this, this terrorist leader. Perhaps even how do we pray for the leadership of Iran at this time? Well, once we know the scriptures, then we can say, listen, God commands us. Jesus specifically commands us to pray for our enemies, hmm. to love our enemies. And if you're going to love them, you need to pray that, that they get saved. So I pray every day in my in my list of prayers that I, I have a list of prayers on my phone and I have them for world leaders and I have them for the good leaders. I mean, good meaning they're they're basically friendly and I have them for evil people and, you know, for my friends and my family and the, the ministry of the Joshua Fund and other things. I pray for the Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, especially as he's late, late in the game health wise. Mm -hmm. And um, because I want him to come to faith in Jesus Christ. And I want Ibrahim Raisi to come to faith in Jesus Christ. And you say, Joel, come on. Like, I know Jesus can save everything, anybody, but I mean, these are wicked people. Yeah. Well, so was Manasseh. Manasseh was the evil, wicked leader of Judah, then the southern kingdom of, of, of Israel. And uh, he was so horrible that God said, I'm going to bring judgment. I'm going to bring the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar to come and destroy Judah and destroy Jerusalem and take your people captive and take them into Babylonian captivity for 70 years. But Manasseh came to faith in the one true God late, late in his life after judgment had already been pronounced on him. But he mm -hmm. did come to true and saving faith. That's a that would be a fun story to tell that story. Nebuchadnezzar himself was an evil, wicked leader of the world's largest empire, the Babylonian Empire, who was used by God to do evil, to crush Israel, to crush Judah, 
and cart off all these people to to uh, into Babylon. But late, late in the game, God first made Nebuchadnezzar go crazy for seven years and then lifted that plague from him and opened his eyes to see the, who the one true God really was. And he came to faith and repented and was a great proclaimer of the, of the one true God of Israel. These are just two examples that God can take people that are wicked and have done wicked things and save them. So let's mm -hmm. never think that, 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 uh, that the supreme leader of Iran is beyond the salvation of, of Jesus Christ or that R Vladimir Putin is beyond the pale or mm -hmm. look, it's possible that God is like, no, I'm done with these people and I'm going to judge them specifically. But it's possible that he's going to bring judgment, but he's going to save these people late in the game. We don't deserve salvation, nor do they. Now, we haven't done as mm -hmm. we, we say, well, I haven't done as bad as Khomeini or Hamanei or Putin. Yeah, that's true. But it doesn't matter. Any sin we've done, it means we're guilty of going to hell. Yeah. So I think that's what we should be praying. But of course... We've got to pray for the liberation of the Iranian people. And I will just say one more thing on that. You know, my my Iranian friends like Hormoz Shariat, the Billy Graham of Iran, they, 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 Hormoz in particular, he says, listen, I want Iran to be geopolitically liberated from this regime uh, tomorrow because I don't want my, to see my Iranian people suffer. But he says that pressure cooker is so unique right now that God has allowed this evil, sovereignly allowed evil, in order to drive people away from Shia Islam and into the arms of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So he goes, I don't I don't want American foreign policy to succeed as much as I want God's kingdom to succeed in Iran. And I think that's an interesting point that yeah. From a geopolitical perspective, of course, we want Iran to be moderate and calm and friendly towards Israel and the United States. That's what we want geopolitically, and we do. But from God's perspective, there are more people coming to faith in Jesus in Iran under yeah. this horrific, wicked regime than they're coming to faith in all the Abraham Accord nations combined, mm -hmm. who are friendly and moderate. So that's just something we got to consider. Same thing with China. Horrible, evil regime, keeping a million Uyghur Muslims in concentration camps and so forth. But this is, you know, a hundred million people have come to faith in, Ch in Jesus Christ in China. So we hate the regime, but God is doing something special. And we just need to understand how God operates on multiple levels. Yeah. Well, that is, that's a great, that's a great point to, to conclude on Joel, because we know that there's so much of a bigger plan that God has. And sometimes in the midst of the hardest circumstances, God produces in the hottest fire, the most refined gold. And in some cases, the believers who come to faith through uh, circumstances that are just horrible by any definition and in places where regimes and, and uh, forces are allied against them, it's, uh, it's tragic. And, and thanks for, thanks for this, this uh, insight into what God could be doing in this country of Iran. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. It's an honor. In fact, Hormoz and I have an agreement. When God does liberate that country, we want to be on the first plane in to go visit uh, his homeland and, and my worst oh. enemy. But I, I'm praying yeah. for my enemy. I love my enemy. And I want the Iranian people to know Jesus. Amen. Amen. And, and I just want everybody who's listening to realize, you know, here at the Joshua Fund, we do exist to bless Israel and her neighbors, the neighboring countries, the, the enemies and the allies that, that have found themselves um, aligned in this uh, interesting time uh, towards what we call the last days. You know, and I would just like to say as, 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 as part of the Joshua Fund, it's, it's a blessing to be able to have Joel uh, outline all of this for us. And Joel, thank you. And for our listeners, if you'd like to learn more about the Joshua Fund, visit our website at joshuafund.com. There you can learn about what we're doing in the Middle East to bless Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus, and how you can participate in the healing work we're doing in this critical region. As always, you can check out our show notes for anything you heard on the podcast that you'd like more information on. So for Joel Rosenberg, the Joshua Fund team, I'm Carl Muller. Thanks for listening to this episode of Inside the Epicenter. 
Hi, I'm Joel Rosenberg. On your left, you'll find some videos we've chosen specifically for you. We look forward to partnering with you to bless Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus.